going on about all this sort of stuff. So I, so I decided I wanted to run uh, a Waimana series uh, on the nature of code governance, uh, particularly from the origins and its source. Where does the idea come from? I'm not so much going to talk about that idea in particular tonight, that is week two. But we can't approach week two without week one, and that is having some sort of orientation around the Treaty of Waitangi, or the Tetility or Waitangi, and what were the forces in play that actually brought this document about in the first place. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out that story tonight, uh, and then I'm going to go past that in some of the ways that the Crown has disregarded that covenant to us. So we're going to start uh, way back here, and then we're going to go up to the treaty, and then we're going to go past it, and then next week we're going to come back to the translations of the treaty and get, a, get our head around the co-op of that head block. Now, just so people know, there's plenty of floor space up the front too if people want to come sit on the floor. Uh, or, or, or whatever, uh, if someone's over in the overflow room and are dying to sit on the floor up here, you're more than welcome to come and sit the So I uh, keep your point. So, uh, all good, everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Welcome, guys. Um, uh, look, there is a, is it, anyone got a spare seat next to him? There's one up here. Uh, there's, a, there's a bench up here. Up the front here. Uh, there's a seat over there. The, yeah, there's a Oh, there's a seat in the middle here as well. Girls are right. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Alright. You got read read this? Read this? Okay, so it's story story time with Uncle Jake. Okay. This is the way this night's going down. Okay. Let me show you a couple of photos here. Uh, on the on the right there is a uh, chief from Napui called uh, Hongi Hika and his uh, nephew, uh, Waikato. In 1820, uh, uh, these two chiefs went over to England. And they went over to England, and there's this crazy king over there. His name was King George. He was a bit of a party animal. And he was mesmerized by this idea that some fellas had come into town, and they had tattooed faces. And he was like, oh, I've got to meet these guys. So they bring them over to a they bring them over to a garden party, and uh, and King George uh, meets these fellas, and he was so blown away by them that he um, just poured out heaps and heaps of gifts and heaps of stuff on them. Now old mate uh, Hongi Hika uh, eventually sails back home, and in Sydney he uh, this is a bit of a naughty thing. He trades all those uh, gifts for. <laughs> Right, for a whole bunch of guns, it comes back and starts what we call the around the, the North Island, bringing some decimation. Now, what you need to know this uh, about here, that in 1820, when he met uh, this lady, Queen Victoria's grandfather, in 1840, Queen Victoria, uh, at the signing of the treaty, was 21 years old. Okay, she was a young, young queen. Now, what this, what this signifies is that in 1820, the northern chiefs made a personal connection with the crown. It wasn't a paper relationship. These guys had been in the courts of the king. They had had an audience with the king. They had dialogue with the king. They had been at Cambridge University and uh, putting down the... Of Te Ao Māori into uh, uh, into a written form, they had been working on that. But uh, uh, but in the 1820s, uh, Napui in particular, up in the northern iwi, made a personal connection with the crown. So when it came to the time of uh, signing the treaty, our people were like, "Oh yeah, rem remember? Uh, you know, w we met her when she was one years old." We, there had been a personal connection between the Queen's family and the families of our people uh, through, through, through our chiefs up there in Northland. Kapot? 
Okay, now, I, I, I'm, I'm not here to talk about uh, the principles of the treaty or anything like that. I'm here to tell you about the story of the context of the treaty. But just to run through some of the principles uh, uh, or some of the articles of the treaty, Article 1 uh, talks about sovereignty in, in, um, in uh, English and kawanatanga in te reo Māori, which we'll talk about next week. Uh, in other words, who, who gets to design a flag for the country? Anyone know the name of this flag? Come on. Laser Kiwi flag. If you believe it or not, someone submitted this as a, 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 as a potential national flag for the country. Okay, uh, uh, Article 2 is about uh, that our chiefs remain out with our tino rangatiratanga, with our chieftainship. And then the last of the sentence says, hey, chiefs, if you want to sell your land, then put it up on trade me, and only the queen gets to bid for it. Kawhai? So Article 2 is about chieftainship and trade me, the trading and the selling of land. Article 3 is that uh, as Māori, we get uh, the ability to become British citizens. Now, in 2023, you go, wow, whoop de doo da day right, That doesn't sound very awesome. In 1840, in, uh, in British foreign policy, it was profound. It had been a sort of backhand complimentary offered to uh, people in Sierra Leone uh, about 20 years ago. But here in 1840 was a genuine offer that indigenous people have the full rights of British citizenship, which at that time in that way had never been done and had never been offered. Now, you, you've all come to Meritapu, right? Man, is this anyone's first time to Meritapu? Uh, welcome to the space. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit freaky walking around a church, right? But uh, did you know uh, there's actually a fourth article? And the fourth article is the right to wakapono, or the right to religion. Um, the, uh, this fellow here, um, uh, Jean-Baptiste Claude from Tillier, he was a French man. Right, he, uh, he leaned over the shoulder of Henry Williams and Captain Hobson on the day, and he said, hey, we need to protect the rights of, uh, of the, the Wesleyans, the Anglicans, the Catholics, and, uh, and, and uh, Mātauranga Wakapono Māori. So, uh, and th this is what it says, the, covenant, the governor says that the several faiths of England, of the Wesleyans, of Rome, and also Māori customs shall all be protected by him. So it was scribbled down on a piece of paper, and on February 6th there it was signed. Now what this means is that the right for, uh, for wakapono, for a, a healthy spirituality from our alternative frameworks, is actually a right under the treaty according to international law, and the fact that our people, indigenous people, sign this covenant and sign this document. Kāpai? So there's actually, while, while publicly we only know there to be three, technically there's actually four. Kāpai? Now, you ready for a story? <laughs> a short history of nearly everything to do with the Treaty of Waitangi. If you look down the bottom here, it's, uh, the, uh, did you know that the Guardian actually, actually endorsed this, saying, truly impressive. It's hard to imagine a better rough guy to the treaty. So you're in for a treat. Okay, who's been to Kororareka? Hands up. Who's been to Russell? Hands up. Same place. Beautiful spot, right? Beautiful place. Yeah, good, 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 good part. So here's a, here's a painting of uh, Russell in the 1830s. In the 1830s, there were over a thousand... A thousand sailing ships coming here every year. All right now, you take at a at a lowest point, you know, twenty five to maybe thirty five sailors on a ship who are ninety nine point nine percent men. You have got thirty five thousand international visitors coming to the Bay of Islands every year. Now. Uh, when these sailors get to the Bay of Islands, what do they want to do? They want to go to church, yeah? <laughs> nah, -uh. right. no, they, wa they want to party. They want to get drunk and uh, partake in the lo local exotic uh, wahine that are down here in the bottom of the South Seas. Have you heard of a fella called... Um, 
Charles Darwin. Right? So he visits here in 1835, and he calls Kororareka the hellhole of the South Pacific. In other words, the Bay of Islands had garnered a reputation in the international sailing community that, hey man, if you want to have a good time, woo, get on down to the South Seas and Poitou. Right? So, uh, so the Bay of Islands was known in the maritime community. And it had become so out, out of control as a drunken brothel because of all these international peoples coming here and uh, participating in stuff. Uh, the only way they could eat was by buying off Māori and there was problems with uh, the weight trade. You know, people would trade goods for food and a lot of those, uh, those sacks of goods, people would fill up the goods with sand or with dust. I want to talk about this fella here, Edward Gibbon Wakefield. Now, I apologise, or I don't apologise, but if you are a Wakefield in this room, it's not your fault. <laughs> okay, let me be very clear about this. I am not talking to you personally, uh, or about you if this is your tupuna. But this is Edward Gibbon Wakefield, and you can't see it down the bottom, but he's had inscribed on his portrait the founder of New Zealand. Did you know this guy founded New Zealand? <laughs> cray cray, right? You know? So here's, here's a story about... He, Wa Wakefield comes from an amazing family, actually. His great... I think his great-grandfather was Robert Barclay, started Barclays Bank. His mum started Children's Savings Bank in, in, in England. So they were quite amazing, uh, quite, quite amazing uh, Fano. However, he he was the black sheep of of the family, and uh, he eloped with a politician's 16-year-old daughter, and ran off to France and got into a whole bunch of trouble. And uh, eventually, the law caught up with him and threw him in prison. And he was in prison for three years. And when he was in prison, he studied economics, and he asked himself this question. How can I make a whole bunch of cash? Has anyone ever asked that question? <laughs> right? And, and here's what he came up with. He was like, we are the British Empire. We are the largest empire in world history. And we have all of these colonies over there in Canada. We've got the colony in Australia. And what's more, we've got this new one down there we're thinking about in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And so what he did in 1837, he started this organization called the New Zealand Association that two years later would change its name to the New Zealand Company. And what he decided to do is that he advertised the sale of land, uh, in, New Z uh, the sale of land in New Zealand to people in the slums of England. Because what he thought is that how could he flush out the slums of Bristol, uh, and, uh, of course, London and York and Newcastle, and see the poor, impoverished people of England come over to the colonies and become landowners. And so what he did in 1837 is that he approached the British government and said, and also what history books called, which leads to my third point, is called uh, what the history books call the humanitarian. In the 1830s... Uh, for three decades, there had been a growing conscience on the side of England. And in 1837, this report here, the Parliamentary Select Report uh, on Aboriginal Tribes, was written in 1837. And in this report, it was a damning report on the British Empire and the way that the British Empire had tr treated Indigenous people. So you have concerned citizens of England and you have politicians on the inside of the British Crown who write this report and tell the government, you know what, it is not good the way that, uh, that the British Crown has treated Sierra Leone, has treated Ghana, has treated uh, um, India, uh, and everywhere where the British Empire has gone, it has been to the detriment of indigenous people. Now think about it, in all of their, their empire history at this point, in 1837, like there's a conscience prick. 
there's this thing that's going on on the inside of them going, you know what? This cannot happen again. So two years after this report, when talk of, of the British Crown wanting to annex New Zealand, uh, um, uh, this report was on the front of these people's mind. Now, I, I put this guy here, uh, um, uh, w William Wilberforce. You know who William Wilberforce is, right? The man who, uh, in 1807, he, he had fought for over a decade to see the end of slavery, and in 1807, finally saw the law passed. Uh, he, he, you know, and about slavery, he wrote, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again uh, that you do not know, that you did not know, right? So, so this is the conscience that we're talking about that was on the inside of England. Now, I put this man up here before, because this man up the top, his name is Sir James Stevens, and he is the nephew of William Wilberforce. Sir James Stevens worked in the colonial office of England from 1837 to 1840 and I think through to, through to the early 50s. Now, when it came time when the British Crown decided we're going to enter into a treaty, this fellow down at the bottom, his name is called Lord Normanby. Lord Normanby is given what to Captain Hobson what is called Lord Normanby's instructions. However, Lord Normanby didn't write the instructions. Sir James Stephen wrote the instructions, the man that made this report. Okay? This guy was William Wilberforce's nephew. Growing up the feet of his uncle and his dad, growing up the feet of William Pitt, who would become Prime Minister, the youngest Prime Minister at the time, understanding what these guys were trying to do around social justice in their country and beyond that. In those instructions that was given to Hobson, this is what it says. I have already stated that we acknowledge New Zealand as a sovereign and independent state. Okay, crucial point. The Queen, in common with her Majesty's predecessors, disclaims for herself and her subjects every pretension to seize on the islands of New Zealand or to govern them as part of the dominions of Great Britain unless the free, intelligent consent of the natives expressed according to their established usages shall first be obtained. So what the instructions were is that whatever the treaty is going to say, it has to make sense in terms of the indigenous language. Clear instructions given to Hobson that the priority was what the indigenous language had to say about entering into a treaty. Okay, to point? So, let me reiterate one of the contexts that brought about the need for this. First one, Kororareka. Second one, New Zealand Company, right? The forces of New Zealand Company wanting to uh, try and buy uh, Māori land as cheap as what they could and sell it off to, um, uh, to uh, English settlers. And the third reason was the humanitarians working on the inside of the British Crown at the time, who were saying, hey, if we need to enter into a partnership, if we need to enter in to annexing New Zealand for any reason, then guess what? We're going to do it in a way we've never done it before. It is not going to be a takeover. Because England had grown a conscience. Carpot? Now, a couple of things. Here, what were our leaders thinking? From the north down to the south, what were our leaders thinking? Why did our people think that it might have been beneficial to enter into a treaty agreement? First one we've already talked about, Kororari. Our people were like, oh man. Hey, Governor Hobson, on behalf of the Queen, if you can come here and sort out those riffraff across the bay and what's going on over there, then yeah, please come and, come and establish a rule of law that will sort all that um, craziness that's going out across the bay. Because Māori didn't feel like, well, we're, we're, our people were prepared at the time to fully interject on what was happening and there were so many people coming uh, that... Uh, uh, 
to, to us, it was a good option for the Queen to come in and set up, set up a rule of law to take care for those people over there. Okay? Second reason, Titi or Waitangi, even though it doesn't talk about it in the treaty, but in our minds, it was a trade agreement. In other words, here were these masses of people from overseas. They were coming here, and you know what they were bringing? What? Flat screen TVs? Falcon XR? Apes? Well, I don't know. Did you like In other words, there was this new, this, this new technology was coming from, over the, from overseas. And from our perspective, and this was, this was the case for Hone Hik, uh, uh, Honehike, who was the first to sign the treaty. This was the case for our Tupuna Te Waripauri, our Ngāti Te Witi Te Wa, uh, chief who was in Wellington at the time. Is that he wanted to secure the pathways of trade with these people that were coming from overseas. And our, our chiefs and our people referred to these as our Pākehā. Because our, our Pākehā were bringing us all this new technology. So one of the motivations that actually gave us a bit of interest to enter into this agreement was to try and secure the pathways of trade of all this new technology that was coming from overseas. Uh, and the third reason I want to talk about is that our, that our people at the time had the confidence to enter into a treaty with the Crown was because five years earlier we had signed Te Wakaputonga, the Declaration of Independence, where we had stood up to the... Uh, we, we had stood up to the international community and we had declared that as the, the United Māori Chiefs we hold the mana over the motu of these islands. This is what we hold. We hold this place and we hold this space. Um, uh, now, uh, and, and this, is, uh, uh, this is what it says, right? This is what we declared. The sovereignty, kingship, kingtanga, the mana from the land of the Confederation of New Zealand are here declared to belong solely to the true leaders, the tino rangatira of our, ga of our gathering of United, United Tribes. So in 1835, we had stood up and we had declared that. And we did that because we had been trading overseas. But the English in Sydney is an exhaustive list. Uh, uh, this is just me trying to make sense of my slash our collective history. Cowboy. So uh, uh, to take Māori interest in the treaty was to take care of Kororareka and other whalers and settlers that were in operation around the world, uh, around the country. Uh, uh, it was to try and secure some pathways of tra trade. Uh, and it was uh, also, we, we knew that we were a state that had declared our mana. Now I put mana in yellow, just so you know that next week we're going to come back and talk about that word, mana. Catch your point? Now, everybody say, Karufa! Okay, this was what Māori called Henry Williams. Uh, karufa means four eyes. Okay. So uh, uh, Māori, uh, Māori called Henry Williams Karufa. Uh, if you go to the Bay of Islands now, um, uh, up there, you've been uh, to the main road of Pai here. It's called uh, Ka uh, Karufa Parade, right? Named after this fella. Named after four eyes, you know, and this is pre Billy T. James, too. Um, now, from 1823, he had been the head missionary in the country of the Church Missionary Society, which was the Anglican Missionary Army. Okay, uh, and he was uh, 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 he was one of the most respected Pākehā European uh, people in the country at that time. Now, have you heard of a fellow called Taropraha? Right, come right, 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 right. The fellow that wrote the haka uh, did a whole bunch of you know going down the South Island and um, being a being a rascal down there to, to our, our, our Kaitahu Wano. Uh, um, uh, his son, Tamihana Tadokra, decided to become a Christian, became a follower of the teachings of Christ. Uh, he went out to Kapiti Island, him and his cousin Martin at the Wikwi, and uh, they read the Pipe of Tapu for six months. They came back and they heard about this thing called missionaries. 
So they go on up to the Bay of Islands and they meet Karupa and they ask Karupa, hey bro, you got a missionary come down to Otaki and Waikanae and live with us down here? And Karupa was like, uh, no, 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 sorry, I don't have anyone to send down, down there. However, a 21-year-old lad had uh, just showed up three weeks ago. His name was Octavius Hatfield. Great metal band name. Right? Uh, uh, and Octavius heard the conversation and, and he goes, oh, excuse me, Henry, uh, my name's Octavius. Uh, uh, I'm 21. I, uh, I'm a severe asthmatic and I'm expected to die within the year. So I'll go. <laughs> and Henry's like, Churro. <laughs> so they all get in a boat in the Bay of Islands. They sail down the east coast. This is around uh, September uh, 1839. And they sail down the east coast and they come into Wanganui Atara, Poneke, Wellington. Right, they come into Wellington Harbour. And Henry gets into Wellington Harbour and he sees all these sail ships there and he gets to land and he sees all these settlers. And he's like, who are you? Oh, and they're like, hi, we're the New Zealand Company. We've just bought Wellington. Now, Henry is not a happy camper. Call it a Māori coach, you follow me and speak Māori? Right. Like, no. now, now, William Wakefield bought Wellington off 600 people, 600 Māori, with a whole bunch of stuff that equated to 400 pounds in 1840. Now we're talking about pots and pans, 12 <coughs> caskets of muskets, 24 pairs of suits, um, a, whole, like a whole bunch of trinkets, because of course cash didn't mean anything in those days, right? Uh, 400 pounds, that same whaling, that same season, the New Zealand company paid William Wakefield a 200 pound bonus just to him. So here he was getting a bonus of 200 pounds and thinking it was a fair enough exchange to buy Wellington for 400 pounds off 600 people. How old was he going? That's not good. Bad juju. Henry's fuming. He gets in his boat, he's going to go around up to Otaki. And he gets just off uh, Kapiti Island and a storm comes. <coughs> Blows him over to the top of Nelson. He gets, to the, he gets over to Golden Bay and he sees uh, a few Euro, Euro followers, European followers there and he's like, uh, who are you guys? And he's like, hi, we're the New Zealand company. I'm known as with, um, uh, with uh, uh, Tarotoha and Tarangi Haiata and other chiefs. And, and he has a courier with a drops off old mate Octavius and Martini and, um, and um, uh, Tamihana Tarotaha. And then Henry begins to walk home to the Bay of Islands. <laughs> okay? Takes him, takes him a couple of months. Oh, hang on. No, it wasn't a couple of months. It wasn't quite a couple of months. Didn't just take an eight hour job. Right. And he walked, this is, the, this is the route he takes. And everywhere he goes, he is meeting with Rangatira Māori, Ariki Māori, our principal chiefs. And our people are hearing, man, we're hearing through the grapevine that there's these people coming from all overseas and they, 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 they want to buy them. Henry gets on a boat to Tauranga and sails up to the Bay of Islands and he arrives back home 11 days before Hobson shows up for the treaty. Now he didn't know, he didn't know the New Zealand company were here. It takes eight months for a letter to go to England and then come back, four months each way. He knew about the New Zealand company, uh, he knew that there were people in England trying to stop the New Zealand company. But he didn't know they had come. He didn't know uh, uh, that Hobson was on his way, to, uh, had been sent to. So Hobson, so he gets home 11 days before Hobson shows up. And over those days, uh, Hobson, uh, a guy called Jack Busby, and Hobson's uh, Stephen, his name is Shortland, these guys take the principles of Sir James Stephen 
they draft up a treaty document. And on the night of February 4, 1814, they give that document to Henry Williams. And Henry Williams stays up all night and translates that document into Te Reo Māori. And then takes that document and translates it again back out of English. Okay, so, so Henry and his son Edward, they sat all night, uh, 4th of February, translating that document. On the morning of the 5th, the chiefs up in North, they come together and they come to discuss the treaty. They go home at the end of the night and they call forth for Henry, say, Henry, we're ready to sign. And so Henry goes, Hobson, Hobson's still sleeping on the boat. So Hobson comes in and the morning of uh, February 6th, 1840, the chiefs are come in and ready to sign to Tira Te Waipa. Now, Hone Heke, what is he famous for? What? Chopping down the bay pole, that is what we, we learned in third form social studies. What they didn't tell us in third, third form social studies is that uh, that bay pole he gave to, to fly the United Tribes flag, uh, and that flag pole was also on his uh, tribal funeral. Um, but on the morning of February 6th, he turns to Henry Williams and the other missionaries and he says this, it's not for us, but for you, our fathers, you missionaries, it's for you to say to decide what it shall be. Shall we sign this document? Now Henry, since 1837, had known about the New Zealand Company and what they did. In September the year before, he had just seen them all beginning to arrive and buy land cheapest chips and then begin to sell to, to the settlers that had arrived. He had just, he'd just walked home through the North Island and had been in Wānana with chiefs all through the, through the country. Right? He knew what this document meant. He knew what it understood. Now, on Hone uh, Heke's point, there were nine documents that went around the country in 1840 and all nine of those documents were taken around by missionaries. Except the Wakatane chief, who was the guy, Fadar was the guy who took it there. He was a businessman, but he originally was a missionary and became uh, the owner of the general store over in Wakatane. It was taken around by the missionaries because Hobson didn't know how to speak to them. Hobson didn't know the way, it didn't have a relationship with our people. Our people had a connection with the missionaries and they trusted the word and the advice of the missionaries. Let me show you here, this is John Hobbs, he was a Wesleyan missionary. missionary. This is William Hobson. Let me just read out something here. This is from Kai Kai. At the treaty signings, Hobson, and the quotes is from Hobson, expected the treaty to initiate a new relationship. His expectation was that Māori and English would share authority and the intervention of Britain would be restrained. At Hokiyama, Hobson said, the Queen did not want the land, but merely the sovereignty, that she might be able more effectually to govern her subjects who had already settled. The residing Wesleyan missionary, John Hobbs, stated that Māori land would never be forcibly taken. Everyone repeat after me. Never be forcibly taken. And that truth and justice would always characterise the proceedings of the Queen's government. No matter their misgivings Māori had of the treaty, and there were many, they were continually reassured that their mana would remain uncompromised. This promise to retain <laughs> mana reaffirmed He Wakaputama, the Declaration of Independence. Remember how I had that highlighted yellow, yellow word? Right? A clear reference to that. That our people retain our mana, our sovereignty over the space. At that same hui, after they heard these guys speak, one of the chiefs came out and said, that if your thoughts are as our thoughts towards Christ, let us be one. We will be one. We believe your intentions to be good. Now check this out. This is an indigenous person who's, who's had the story of Jesus for maybe about seven years. And they understand the teachings of Christ deeply. 
and they say, if you are going to act like Christ, as we do, then, you're, then this is a safe agreement. What do we need to do? Okay, let me just read out the park out. Uh, article 2 for a second. Her Majesty the Queen of England confirms and guarantees to the chiefs and tribes of New Zealand and to the respective families and individuals thereof the full, exclusive and undisturbed possession of their lands and estates, forests, fisheries and other properties which they may collectively or individually possess so long as it is their wish and desire to retain the same in their possession. Uh, over 500, oh, oh, I forget the name, has anyone got the exact number? Five, I think it's 542. Chief signed, signed the document saying our people can retain our land, our time, things that are precious to us. The dark represents Māori land holdings. This is from the New Zealand Encyclopedia, Online Encyclopedia Tiara. 1860. After signing the document, we could hold our land. 50 years, 1890. Come down to 1910. At the bottom left, on the bottom right, 1939. 100 years after our people signed an agreement with the, a 21-year-old queen that said, we can retain the mana and the ownership and our rank and our rights over our spaces. This is what happened. Now, we can get back to that later. In 1860, the Crown, by discovery, had taken all of the South Island and sold it off. 20 years after the signing of the Crown. Uh, 20 years after the signing of one of the greatest chiefs at the time, Chief Tuvawaiki, down on Rua Poki Island. You know what? To honour the people. The, when he signed the treaty, he dressed up in a, in a, in a, in a British naval suit just to, to honour Hobson. Uh, uh, and, and signed the treaty. But 20 years after his agreement, uh, his tie offender was taken. This is from 2017. This has probably changed, maybe now. But this is the current. Maori owned on Aotearoa right now, 4.8% of the land. After signing an agreement saying that we could retain it for as long as we want. Stand up, take a break.
Hall Street Acquisition, preference to nearby Park Alley, and roads were sometimes circuitously routed through Maori reserves. Now, um, uh, this guy who um, is a premier of Maori, um, around the Public Works Act, he said, the Maori who wanted peace would be treated with moderation. Those who resist will be pacified. So that settlement could proceed. A few years after this, when um, uh, Mr. Bowie came into power, he borrowed uh, his ten million pound uh, from the British government. The British government gave the New Zealand government ten million pound based on the collateral to buy and sell as much Maori land as they possibly could. So in the 1870s, this is when a lot of our um, Scandinavian farmers from around the world and, um, and Dutch farmers from, the world, from around the world came to Aotearoa uh, because of that, that borrowing of that money. The borrowing of that money from overseas is what New Zealand infrastructure was built on. And it was built on the, the borrowing by the seas to build New Zealand infrastructure was from money coming from overseas under the premise that the Crown had to take and grab as much money as they could. So, 1865, the Native Land Court. It was designed to administer the Native Land Act from uh, um, a, a year or two before. Um, the design of the court was to whittle away customary title and force tribal land into the ownership of ten people, thereby dispossessing the majority of the tribe. Judith Bennett, a uh, famous historian, calls this act an, an, uh, an intentional act of war. Now this is actually important. If I go back to this slide, was doing first in confiscating land is that under the Treaty of Waitangi, all that land was Māori customary title. When the Crown stole it, what they gave back, they didn't give it back as what they took it, as a Māori customary title. They gave it back under a Crown licence which means it had a, a, a crown title, which means for Māori, Māori were allowed to own land. Ten, ten people were allowed to own land. They took it down from the tribe down to ten people. But essentially, what, what really what they were doing was changing the game and the rule of land. By rights of the treaty, we could maintain our land under customary title. But by the crown taking control of it, meant that they flip it back into crown title. <coughs> and none of the land that was taken ever got given back in the way that it was taken before. Mm -hmm. So here we are in the Native Land Court. Uh, court the Native Land Court. Henry Sewell, the Justice Minister at the time, said the purpose of the Native Land Court was to bring the great bulk of the lands in the Northern Islands within the reach of colonisation and the detribalisation of the Māori to destroy, if it were possible, the principle of communism upon which their social system is based and which stands as a barrier in the way of all attempts to amalgamate the Māori race into our social and political system. Is there anything in either the English version of the treaty or the Tiriti or Waitangi that actually allows and says that this, the, the Queen could do this? No way. Now, I want to make a point here because on, on Facebook land, um, people have been referring to this talk as so communistic. <laughs> let, me, let me say this.
communism is a European idea. It is not a Maori way. So when Singwell wants to describe our people as functioning in communism, he's actually taking a European facade and describing us in a European facade sense. Our people don't function like communism, we function like colonialism. And there's a massive difference. The, some of the principles of communism are so beautiful and so noble. It doesn't work because you have dicky elites who try to run it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Māori society never had road lit. Well, I can say never, sure. <laughs> sure a few bad years now. But Māori society had a separation of power. Sure, we had a chief. We had our ārīki. But we also had our Latina, our community leaders. We had our Komatua, our Kui and our Karawa. And these guys could grab that fellow by the ear, pull your head in, mate. And they could oust that, that chief if he didn't respect the people of a certain way. Oh, I, 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 I put this quote from Henry Seymour in here because so many people today refer to a Māori way of being and doing things as communistic or communism, and it's not that at all. We believe in the Wanona Tama, or the Wanona Tama of all things, the family, that there is a family connection with all living things, and it's different to communism, which is this idea of trying to be socially just except you have a few capitalists in control. <laughs> well, they're equal, but some of them are equal. 1867, Native Schools Act. And this is the last uh, slide I want to keep up. Or the last point we in the last um, time I want to If Māori wanted to be educated by the colonial system. Not only did they have to put aside to the world, and it becomes legal that only in schools English had to be used. Remember we can protect our poem, and we saw that They needed to supply, uh, then not only did they have to put aside to the world, they needed to supply the land, the administration of the schools, Pay for half of the building costs in contrast to normal state schools. So the government will build all of the state schools. Right, is this, so, so here is the British government going back on their idea of giving British citizenship to Māori and saying, no, you are not British citizens. You are not one with us under the system, you are ours. You have to pay for it. Right? In 1879, when the native schools came under the Ministry of Education, this also meant the land of those schools sliding into crown control. Now, people think that the notion of co governance means that for some reason, a thousand believe part of are going to take control of land and not allow anyone else to go into certain spaces and things like that. Uh, do you know it is the Pākehā story? That is the Pākehā story of this nation. That is the Crown governmental system who instituted that notion, and not just the notion, but the practice of first. Now, <coughs> Takutai Moana, for sure, CB legislation. Right? At the time, leaders of the two largest TV, right? Sir Mark Solomon, Tokuroi Nogi They go and they have a private conversation with John King, Julia Brown, 
Pilgrimage, Stephen Jewish, Nick Smith, National Party type of. Now, who can remember the billboard Kiwi, not Iwi? Because here was this noise going around and trying to say, oh, Mary's trying to steal the abortion under the treaty. So these guys go into private conversation with governments at the time and say this. There is no Iwi in this country that wants to stop any New Zealander from going to any part of the coast of this country. This is five or six laws of history. These are big laws that have taken massive chunks of land and massive chunks of female. All in breach of the Tertility Covenant. The Tertility Covenant. The, the contract, the agreement that was made in partnership with Holson and Queen Victoria. Now, I just, I, I just want to finish here by going back to William Wilberforce's quote. <laughs> you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you did not know. This house here has been built in partnership with many type of St. Mary's and an this is not a, a, a this is not a wadi two model, so there's no ancestral carving in this house. This is a wadi wana, designed and made to learn our history and to learn our story and to learn the story of Iwi Māori. It opened in April 2000, April 13, 2023. The year. 2023 is the first year in the history of New Zealand that all children in our schools will be taught the story of our land. Think about this. In nearly 200 years of being a nation, it's fine to learn about the Battle of Hastings. Right? Like, it's fine to learn about World War I and World War II and our brave forebears, right? My great, 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 my great grandfather, right? His name was Edinoka Taitea Ruka. And he signed up in the Pioneer Battalion and he parked out by his name to Robert Allen Woods to go overseas. Right? So we might learn about these. But here in 2023 is the first year our kids get to learn the story of our own land. Now here's the deal. Like this, this, these stories in this history, like it is, it is, it's horrible. 
It's just it's terrible. terrible. But guess what? It's, it's not your fault. fault. It's, it's, it's not my fault. fault. It's your fault. Right? But what happens is that lack of education and lack of ignorance blocks our minds and blocks us out of truly understanding our story. Now, guys, our story and our collective history, even though there's some nasty and some horrible things, it is so fresh. And like America's screwed, eh? But <laughs> sure, they're, they're the largest empire. They, they are barely even approaching, truly beginning to deal with this. Do you see how many treaties there are in the United States of America? There's over 700, and 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 Americans grow up not knowing about one of them. You know why? Because those treaties were charlatan treaties. They were tricks. They were designed to try and take Native American land. Ours is different. Everyone grows up knowing something about it. Even if it is, hey, man, we've got 50 for six off. Right? But everyone knows, oh, there's something about it, like Tony or, 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 or whatever. That's because in our document and in our agreement, there's actually a conscience at the root of it. And what is happening in our land in our generation is that that conscience is being awoken across the entire country. Maori ma, European ma, Korean. Then you are entering into a period of our history where we are awakening to our own story. And what that means is that it's actually a sign of maturity. It actually means that we are hopefully maturing as a nation to be able to go, man, I've got some ugly ass pimples on my face. And other locations. Right? I'm, I'm breaking out here. Right? This pus that's beginning to pop. On the, on, 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 on the space of what it is, it's we're growing up. But you've got to go through that story. We can't afford to let another generation of New Zealanders not know who we actually are. We are a collection. We are, we are, look, we are a collection. This is the thing I love to say. We are a multicultural nation nestled in a bicultural pasture. Okay? The treaty is between the British Crown and Mangati Mao. It's not between Koreans and Mao. It's not between Dutch and Mao. It's between the Crown and Mom. Okay? This is what this agreement is. This is not, it's not the preference of Mom doing it, it's the preference of the British Crown doing it. Entering into a special partnership and a special relationship. Right now in New Zealand, all of our power structures, people wrote, someone wrote to me two weeks ago. Why don't you accept all Guess what the notion of multiculturalism is? It's propaganda on one side. This country is not multicultural, it's modern. Everything that is run on this land and the power system of this place is, is filtered through a Eurocentric way of doing That is not what the treaty says. It's not what the aspirations of this document says. 
This is not to at all to belittle a Eurocentric way of being. Just stand on the hill of victory and say, Ah, oh, you can do it, you shot the government. She gave us all the $20 million. Who do This country, this country is. That if in our generation, everyone in this room and everyone in our town, if we can get this right, you watch what our kids and our grandkids are going to be involved. If we don't mature into an embracing an indigenous perspective of the earth and the world, not, not, not all, you know, not just that. But taking the best of the mind, the best of the voice and way of thinking, to bring those into a partnership, you watch what our kids, our grandkids, and our grandchildren, great grandchildren, are going to be in the world. They will be extraordinary world leaders. You might have a Switzerland that can do German, Italian, and French. But you don't have anywhere or very few places in the world where you have Western and Indigenous fully grown, fully matured, and fully functioning together. This is the secret power that has been thought of. Two different ways of thinking, two different ways of being, two different ways of understanding coming into the now, Reverend Dan Langer, I mean, part of that I'm doing now. Say, come. Well, it's 
it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a it's this is what this thing is. The tree team, the utility of all white time, it's it's a symbol. There are some there are some points in it, but let's be honest. It was so hastily created. And therefore to understand it, you've got to know why it was hastily created. What was it trying to do? It was trying to stop settlers. But truckloads and truckloads and shiploads and shiploads of settlers buying off land cheap to a company and then on selling it to people elsewhere. And guess what? They did it for four years. <laughs> they actually worked for four years. Uh, we'll talk a bit about that next week. But the, the legal language of the Tiriti Waitan, the Tiriti Waitan, yes, it says some, and it, and it makes some very clear things that you can define, you know, uh, and all these sorts of things. But the point of it is that it is a, it is a symbol and it is the foundational thought of our bicultural culture. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, can you put your uh, Pākehā hat on and tell me why you think uh, old white people are so scared of sharing power? <laughs> <laughs> That's all you have to know. 
Democracy is awesome, but let's just be honest about its weakness. Does it require holding the truth? Our cultural lens, and guess what? You will never change this. If you try to change this, you're never going to change this. Our people will vote as it's taking the vote. That's never going to change. We go to the polls with that in mind, like who's holding into the agreement and the government. The Declaration of Independence by the Confederated Northern Tribes of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, was this representative of uh, Māori across Aotearoa or predominantly the Northern Tribes? Uh, pre predominantly the Northern Tribes, but later on in the year they did go down south as well. They did go down further. So there were tribes added to it over the court. Uh, sorry, the signatures and uh, Iwi added to it over the course of a couple of years. Yeah, even up to 1839, people have been added into it. Yeah. Uh, what happened to Queen Victoria's commitment to Maori? Uh, um, what happened to it? I think it's a small meeting. People still try to find it. <laughs> Objects. Just keep the answer to yourself. There's a set of objects above and there's a set of objects below. I want you to tell me which is the odd one or no, tell yourself. You can make a decision within a second. Which is the odd one out? You ready for this? Which is the odd one out? Okay, let's start at the bottom. Which is the odd one out? The wood, why the wood? Because it's not at all. Can anyone get into anything else to And the little one, which means that the one on the other 
those who saw them must be mum and dad. So the child belongs to the mum and dad, making the other one an uncle. So the uncle is the one now. Now, he came up with that straight away. Paul, Paul I have it, the, the uh, cultural anthropologist that made this diagram, has taken it around indigenous people all around the world, and they say the same thing. The Māori way of thinking has been fashioned and is made to describe reality not by what things are in and of themselves, but by what they belong to. In the Māori social order, reality is belonging. In a Pākehā, European way of thinking, reality is described and it gets its definition by what something is in and of itself. That's the old one now because it's the child. And that all by itself is a little child. And an indigenous way of thinking does not describe the world by what it is in and of itself. Which is why Damon, when he opened us up today, he greeted our Creator. He greeted our Mom. He gre greeted all of our Tupuna who have gone on before us. To locate that we are here, not by the merit of ourselves, but by the love and grace of generations that have gone before us, and by the land that sustains us. That's a Māori way of thinking. Why should our children, why should you, learn to learn Māori? that is completely different to how you might think that that's the other one. This here shows you actually what partnership is and how much you have been trained to think. You have been trained by a cultural narrative that teaches you that little one's the other one. There are other cultural narratives that have a complete different opinion to yours, and that opinion is valid. Now, about to tell my in all of Creator's creation, Tarell Māori, which is the expression of this way of thinking, is only unique to this landscape. And it's still southern Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right, this, the, the, this way of thinking, and this way of perceive, perceiving, and this way of understanding reality is only unique to this landscape. So imagine if you could harness that unique way of thinking, and take that unique way of thinking, and partner it up with the beauty a way of thinking that knows how to build rockets, that knows how to pull apart atoms and protons and neutrons and explore quarks and string theory and also, in other words, delve in to the most minute way of existence and being and see things that as the mind we've never seen before. Fire like, like I remember uh, Komatu and Northam, you know, this, you know, Māori Master described this in his book, how he's describing to a Komatu how about how they split the atom and uh, created this incredible bomb in this Komatu. Do they know how to look at that? <laughs> <laughs> Another question, do they know how to put back into its place of belonging? And of course, they're not. No, so the Māori way of the sea. That's why I thought it was important, because when you get to that, you actually harness a new way of seeing reality. Uh, this question is, uh, so you're saying we should all get used to feeling uncomfortable? Ooh. <laughs> um, look, yeah, that's a good question. Um, did you come up with it? 20-year-old.
you're wrong. I, I made, made the conscious, conscious decision. Ah, screw Marilyn. Servants is white people. Servants are skateboarders and snowboarders. Yeah, that's your way to hell. You, you know, know what? Because, because I always felt like that. Because I felt like I should know how to play the part. But I have never known how to play the part. That's how I felt. Uh, it's <coughs> always hard entering into these things in this place. You know, you know I had to make a conscious decision uh, to go, actually, you know what, man, this, is, this part of who I am is actually an important reality to me. And when I begin to understand, you know, I was born in Jefferson and Lucas. Uh, and, you know, and in the part of this process, I, I find out how my great grandfather changed his name. You know, and how Parker refused to call his dad Tare. Um, so they just called him Charlie. Charlie Lucas instead of Tare Luca, you know? Uh, uh, so you, you, you learn all these stories. Um, look, I, 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 I'm always the guy that's going to show up and, you know, most of the time not, not feel like I, 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 I know what I'm doing because my, my child hasn't been that way. But what has happened to me is that I've had a shot of truth into my life, like a shot of beauty in there. Because oh my goodness, the way of creation is so lovely and Marley had a beautiful way of expression in creation. I'm like, oh, that's, that, that's me. Then what happens is that all of a sudden I go, oh my goodness, I can learn. I can learn. So, I, so what has happened in my life, due to practice and due to repeatedly repeatedly putting myself in awkward positions of not understanding, I've become a learner. I've become a learner. I've, I've been, my father was a church minister. I've grown up in the church uh, from about the age of two. I've, I've been leaders in church streams. I've been leaders in other Christian organisations. And when I understood this reality, I left it all and spent three years on the floor of my life in my law, beginning to learn to live. I was like, oh my goodness. So there is a cost to this. And you need to make the cost of feeling uncomfortable to save the kids and parents so that they don't have to. Last question. Do you believe, uh, do you genuinely believe that in uh, us versus them is the best way of moving forward in the future? Yeah, cool. Um, um, it's, uh, I'll, 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 i will i will question was, uh, do you genuinely believe that in us uh, versus their mentality is the best way of moving forward in, in this century? Uh, if so, why? Uh, absolutely not. Not, not, from, not. not from me. Some people might. Um, uh, I don't think I know a lot of people do. Uh, but for me, I would say no. Uh, because it's immature. Uh, uh, and however... I mean, dude, you know, the, the, the Māori crown issue, uh, or Māori kāke issue, if, it's, if, if it becomes an us versus them, everyone loses. There will be a short-term gain for, uh, for a few at some point, but ultimately everyone loses. As a follower of Christ and in Christ's teachings, say, saying that our inheritance is in one another, what that means is that our life and our futures actually exist in other people, and our relationship and our connectedness to other people. Uh, this is this is why I say it's a secret. It's a secret weapon. Is that when you know, best way to say it is not Martha. You know, Auntie Martin and Pai Oka, when you can walk in my shoes, as I have as Marley, and speak to me, and 
Three more languages. They will be together. They will be together. Uh, at present, we're not. You know, so I, I think, like, like, like relationship is the key. Waka wananatanga. Wananatanga is the Maori centric. We, now, within our framework, we've got, connect, we've got very specific and unique connections to land and space. The reason we entered into a treaty was to open a partnership to this group to come and be welcome and be free and, and, and lead in our space. Uh, uh, that agreement still holds true. That's why we call it a covenant, which is what we'll talk about next week, the nature of a covenant. That is embedded in the, uh, the Maori version of the political world. Hit the bottom. I do just want to say that was the last question, but we do have uh, a bunch of others, uh, which Jay and I will go through over the course of the week, and we will endeavour to answer those over the next coming weeks. So if you didn't get your questions answered, it's not because I vetoed it, it's because we ran out of time, and we will look to try and answer those in the coming weeks. Uh, so that's an invitation to come back and to continue this journey together.